Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Asia, and if you've ever seen me speak, uh, you know that we have a lot to cover today. And if it's the first time you've ever seen me speak, welcome to the club. Uh, okay, so in my work, what I do is I work with SaaS companies on two primary things. The first is troubleshooting growth. And the second is finding new growth opportunities. And whenever I help SaaS companies find new growth opportunities, there's also two things that I'm typically looking at. There's qualitative insight. This is customer interviews, research, surveys. And then there's quantitative analysis. We're going to talk about the quant side today. And what I also find is, in my work, there's, uh, there's all kinds of charts and graphs that we can look at in life. Um, especially whenever you run a SaaS company. But the chart that I pull up quite often in my growth work is the revenue cohort retention chart. How many of you have seen specifically revenue cohort retention before? Show of hands. OK, a few hands. OK, perfect. Uh, here's the funny thing, though. Whenever I show that report to founders or their growth teams, a lot of the times I get two reactions. The first is, OK, yeah, 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 like, you know, we know that uh, it's not as good as we'd like, or maybe it's actually going really well. And they're like, oh, yeah, like, we're really proud of this. Uh, but sometimes I get this reaction, which is like, lol, I don't know what that chart is. What, what does it mean, and what do I do with it? Today, we are going to talk about the dashboards, KPIs, and metrics that you can use to identify your growth opportunities. These growth opportunities are not just going to be on the acquisition side. Growth is holistic. It, looks at all different aspects of growth. It's activation, it's retention, it's expansion, it's monetization. All of these things ultimately create and facilitate the foundation for what incredible growth looks like. The KPIs and metrics we're going to cover, um, some of them are going to require a little bit of math. But the first one I want to introduce you to is the percentage of expansion revenue. So forgive me in advance. There's a little bit of math on this one. But this is the only one that requires math, I promise. Expansion revenue. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about last month's MRR. It could also be the last three to six months of MRR. And I want you to do a couple of things. First, uh, if you have ProfitWell, ChartMogul, Barometrics, any of these, I want you to just pull that open if you have your computers with you and do a quick calculation. Look at the total amount of net new MRR. Add that up. And then I want you to calculate uh, how much upgrade or expansion MRR was generated. And then I want you to divide them. You're going to end up with a percentage. It's going to be the percentage of expansion revenue in direct correlation to your net new MRR. If you want to be extra, you can take the last three to six months. But here's what I want you to aspire towards. You're going to have a number. It's going to be some percentage. If it's within the 20 to 40% mark, you're, you're, probably, like, you're, you're probably experiencing growth that feels very natural. Uh, what I find is companies that have very high, easy, sustainable growth, many of them are in the 20 to 40% range. So 20, 40% of their revenue comes from expansion. If you are much less than that, let's say you're in the like 1% or the 5% range, this actually, this is, a, this is a good thing. That means that this is a growth opportunity for you. This means that a couple of things. Well, first, this tells us how much expansion revenue did we actually have in the last months, or on average of the last three to six months. You can take a rolling uh, average if you'd like. The other thing that this tells me, though, is it tells us, do you have a really high dependency on a lot of net new acquisition? If you have a very high dependency on net new acquisition, it means it puts a lot of pressure on marketing and sales to constantly generate a bunch of net new MRR just for sustainable growth. And the last thing that this tells us, this, this number, this percentage, it tells us what is the current state of monetization and pricing in general. Companies that are in the 20 to 40% range tend to have a really strong monetization and pricing strategy that's backing it up. What do you do if that percentage is not as good as you'd like for it to be? That's OK. Like I said, this is actually a good thing. This is actually a growth opportunity. Um, here's what I want you to do instead. If you are a relatively more established SaaS company, it's time to reevaluate expansion strategy in general. It's far more expensive to gain a new customer than it is to keep your customer and to expand them. It's not just about keeping them. Expansion also has to happen in some kind of way. And the second thing I want you to be thinking about is, again, if you have a relatively lower percentage of expansion revenue, I also want you to be thinking about 
what are some of the product opportunities that we have that could become add-ons that we can monetize? What are some of the feature sets or plans that we could adjust to ultimately generate more expansion revenue? All right, so expansion revenue, that's the first one. The second one, uh, and this one is one that I find that a lot of product teams especially, like, like they're, pretty in, they're very intimately familiar with. But if this is your first time seeing this chart, this is a new user retention chart. New user retention, basically what this is telling us is when someone signs up for the very first time, how long do we have with that person before they drop off and forget? So this chart is telling us in particular, uh, within 24 hours, how long does someone have uh, doing, taking any action in the product? Uh, this particular product has about 5% retention rate, new user retention rate, within the very first 24 hours. It's not great, but it's still a starting place. This is what happens when we look at product activities, however, that indicate a relatively uh, engaged user, someone who comes in, signs up, is engaged, and ultimately is taking actions that imply that uh, this might actually be a really good potential customer. We want the chart that looks like the one at the top here. Like We want our chart to look like this when it's got uh, all the lines on average. What we're looking for, this is tough to do depending on your product, but what we're looking for is we're looking for a more than 50% average new user retention after 24 hours. Uh, the company I just showed you was about 5%. Ideally, we improve the product experience and the activation experience to get most users on average at the 40 to 50% uh, new user retention rate. If you're, uh, if you're a new user retention rate, if you've never looked at yours for your product, I highly recommend you get a tool like Mixpanel or Amplitude uh, to help you with this. But if you know what yours looks like and you have a report that's like this already, uh, but it doesn't look as great as you'd like for it to, that's okay. That's a good sign. Again, it's a growth opportunity. So what does this tell us? This tells us a couple of things. Uh, well, first, it tells us how long we have with new users. Um, whenever someone signs up for your trial or even uh, closes as a customer, if you have a sales-led process and they're actually using the product, it also tells you what is their overall engagement in the product in general. Uh, but this also tells us how long on average do we have. Do, do we have 24 hours? Do we have a couple of weeks? Or do we actually have a few minutes, which is even more intense? The next thing that this tells us, though, is this tells us uh, what activities or actions should new users be taking in the product in order to stick around, in order for us to actually have a chance of making them a paying customer? So here's what to do. Let's say you've got your new user retention report. Uh, you've got Amplitude. You've got Mixpanel. And like I said, if you don't, um, then this is going to be tough to calculate. But if you do, and again, your graph does not look as good as you'd like for it to, here's what I need you to do. I need you to sit down with your team and define activation for real this time. Many teams, whenever I ask them, what is an activated user, many people can't actually give me an answer. This is a problem. Sometimes, though, the founder says one thing, the product person says another thing, and then the marketer says something completely different. So we need to, one, have an answer for activated user, two, get actual real alignment this time around it, and then three, we actually need to measure this. If we're not measuring this, we're leaving money on the table, and also value for your customer as well. The next thing I want you to do, I want you to actually audit your activation and onboarding experience. Both are critical. Many people think of activation as just like this like fuzzy thing in the sky. Um, like your onboarding is just your sign up flow. It's not. It's your whole entire customer experience. Everything contributes to activation. And when it's poor, you can tell growth is really hard. But when it's incredible activation experience, an incredible onboarding journey that makes it really clear what product actions to take for customers to get value, much easier. Uh, and then finally, I want you to prioritize high retention product actions. So in this chart that I showed you, those lines at the top, those are all high value product actions. Those are behaviors that customers ideally should be taking uh, whenever they first sign up. We want to get uh, the baseline to that line if possible. OK, so we know what to do. That is new user retention. That's number two. We're going to go back to this chart. So revenue core retention. So a few of you were familiar with this. Uh, to explain this chart very quickly. So revenue cohort retention. If you have ProfitWell, if you have ChartMogul, if you have Bear Metrics, you have this chart for free right now. You could pull it up on your computer and you could take a look. And I want you to brace yourself if you've never seen it before. Um, it could look really scary or it could look really awesome. It just depends. 
But I can tell you, uh, this particular company, there's a couple of reactions, um, but what this chart tells us is, on average, how much revenue do we retain month over month from the month that the revenue was generated? So for example, if I sign up and I pay for your, comp for your SaaS in October of 2022, and my, my revenue, my dollars get counted for that month, and then uh, ProfitWell, what have you, will do the hard work of counting how long did you retain my dollar? How many months did I stick around? What's crazy about this chart is you can have, quote, healthy churn. You can have very healthy revenue churn. Oh, yeah, our churn is 5%. And you might have a graph that looks like this. If you have a chart that looks like this, growth is going to be tough. Uh, this particular company, so I'm not actually not even sure if you can see this number, um, but at the six-month mark, this company retains about 38% of revenue. What that means is every six months, this company has to work, bust their butt, to get and to replace 60% of their MRR every six months. That's really, really hard. Oh, and by the way, disclaimer, this is, I don't have a, this is not my client's chart. Uh, I actually got this from, you can Google this. Um, but I have clients that have charts that look like this, and I have clients that look like the chart I'm about to show you. Uh, but that, that creates incredible pressure on acquisition. Marketing and sales basically have to churn out all the trials and all the leads just to stay alive. That's wild, wild. Can you imagine replacing 60% of your revenue every six months? Feels like you're pushing a boulder like, uh, up the Pyrenees. Like, it's bonkers. Here's what you actually need to be striving for instead. And this is one of my absolute favorite stats. I can tell what growth looks like for a company if they don't have this. You need more than 80% revenue cohort retention after 12 months. That might sound absolutely crazy to you, but I promise you it's real. Here's how I know. Uh, I have, this is also not one of my clients' charts. However, I have a client that's actually doing even better than this. I have a couple of clients actually that are doing way better than this. This is what it looks like when it's healthy, when it's actually more than healthy, it's thriving. This chart is moisturized, she's hydrated, she's in her lane. She, like, she is living her best life, this chart is. Uh, but in this particular chart, and uh, I believe this one actually at 12 months, we've got, um, I think it's like right at 79%, so it could actually be even better. There's data that supports that high growth companies, companies that are growing very sustainably, are doing even better. They're actually getting 110%, 120%, revenue core retention at 12 months. That's actually a real stat from uh, Lenny's newsletter from Lenny Ratchesky, if you're familiar with his work. What does this chart tell us? What do you do when you see it? And what does it actually mean? This tells us our customers getting value and sticking around. Both are important. It also tells us if they're sticking around and then expanding later. And as I mentioned before, one of the secret sauces to growth in general is not just to get customers, but to keep them and to grow them. The next thing that this tells me is if this revenue core retention uh, report does not look as good, if it's not so hot, it also tells me how much pressure have you put on marketing and sales to churn out those trials. We need as many trials just to stay alive. And then finally, this also tells me if, uh, if we have a good monetization strategy. Because if we are getting 100%, 120% at six months, and also at 12 months, we probably have a really strong pricing strategy and a monetization strategy that supports our growth model. If we don't, we'll probably still, like, we can get, we can get to charts that look like this. Um, but if we want even better, then we need something that does even more at the 12-month mark. Okay, so what do you do? Let's say you pull up your chart and you're like, oh, Asia, this is not, this isn't it. <laughs> She's not hydrated. She's not moisturized. <laughs> She's not in her lane. Um, this is what you do. Okay, so first, there's really three things that impact that revenue core retention report. First is product discovery. It's very, very, very likely that there's product opportunities that we're leaving on the table. It's possible that we have not contributed enough value on the long-term scale for customers. This means building features that add to uh, the customer base's value over time. The second thing that this tells me is it's very possible we're not attracting the right customers and uh, we're having like a, a, a portion or a segment of customers that maybe aren't as quality or maybe aren't as ideal, but they're showing up in our numbers and they're showing up in our reports and our stats. Um, there's two answers to this. The first is strategically decide, do you want to work hard to keep them? And the second is you could simply filter out the data and see what your actual um, qualified 
high potential revenue core retention looks like. And then lastly, I want you to revisit pricing and monetization. Um, you'll notice that this is a little bit of a trend. But uh, again, companies that have really powerful, super strong six month and 12 month cohort retention are looking at 100 plus, 100% plus. And that can only happen with really good, with an excellent monetization strategy and also, again, a strong model. All right, this is number four. Are you guys with me? All right, I see some nods. All right, okay. Y'all are awake. You're not, you know, too full from lunch. Um, okay, the last one. This is what the pros do. This is what companies like Airbnb, uh, all of the really high performing, high growth companies, this is what they are doing. They are actually measuring and reporting on customer based success KPIs. I want you to imagine a customer journey, not necessarily the business journey, but the customer journey. So, what are all the stages and phases that customers go through in order to achieve value? I want you to map that. So I have an example here. We've got problem. This is when customers realize that they have a problem. We've got interest. Uh, they're interested now in solving it. Then there's first value. They get value from the product for the first time. Then we get into value realization. OK, yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the value. And then there's continued value. So even after six months, even after 12 months. And then finally, I've expanded. I've grown. My value has increased. And therefore, me as a customer, I have increased as well. You're going to take that journey, and then you're actually going to add KPIs to them. But here's the trick. You're not going to add business KPIs. You're going to add customer-based success KPIs. These are not your typical average KPIs. This is based off of what does a customer have to do and experience in order to achieve value in the product. And if you are smart, you're going to measure this. OK, so problem and interest, most of us um, are going to use KPIs like traffic, like trials, demos. OK, fine. Those are, those are technically business KPIs, but they are also customer-based ones as well, technically. But then once we get to first value, now we're getting into product activity. And you're going to notice from this point on, it's product-based activity. Let me give you an example. Um, I do not work with this company. I actually signed up recently for it. It's called Commit Action. And Commit Action is a software-enabled uh, service, and it's an accountability service. If you've ever had work that you know that you need to do and you don't want to do it, Commit Action might actually be a really interesting tool for you. It's basically you hop on a call every week with an accountability coach, and they're like, Asia, what, what, what do you got this week? Like, what do you need to do that you don't want to do, that we need to schedule and get it on your calendar? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got to write this article, and then I got to like, you know, record a podcast and blah, blah, blah. OK, great. When are we going to do it? I'm like, well, I think you know, Thursday at 2 PM. OK, great. Then she schedules it. She books it. And then every few days, she checks in with me. Asia, did that get done? Did that get done? If not, why not? What happened? And then every single week, we report back on last week's tasks. And then the next week, uh, we schedule the upcoming week's tasks. And I just signed up. I'm like two to three weeks in, and already I'm mapping out in my head what my customer success, uh, customer success KPIs probably look like. This is an example. This isn't real. I don't work with them. Um, but based off of my experience, I would guess that my first value moment was when I booked the call with my coach, when I scheduled my very first tasks, uh, and then when I experience true value, like when I like fully realized the value, it's probably like around week two, week three, when I'm like getting shit done. And I'm like, ooh, yeah, like I really feel it. I don't think that they have plans or like other like pricing tiers, but if my value had expanded, I imagine that I would upgrade to a different plan because I'm just experiencing so much kickassery that I'm like, man, commit action's amazing. I love them. I love this. They make me feel great. You know, I'm happy to pay them more money. And then again, with, with a, a growth or value expansion, now we're getting into, I'm referring it to other people. Maybe I'm doing some add-ons. They don't actually, I don't think that they actually have these things. But if it were me, that's how I'd think about it. Here's where it gets really fun, though. You can actually measure this. Uh, obviously, I don't work for commit action or with commit action. But if I were to, I would take that journey and then measure it. I would put that into something like an amplitude or a mix panel. And you can actually see where along the customer journey people fall off. Maybe they don't ever achieve value realization. Maybe they get to first value, but then they never expand. What's important is that for you and your business, you know what that chart looks like. And you can actually do it because it's based on what? Product activity, which is measurable. If you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend that you check out the book, uh, Forget the Funnel. So it's run, uh, written and run by my two really good friends, Claire and Gia. And they talk all about customer-led growth. So if this is interesting to you in terms of the process of getting here, highly recommend checking this book out. 
Uh, but in the meantime, what does this tell us? It tells us a couple of things. It tells us where customers get stuck in the value cycle, not just the life cycle, but where is the value cycle stop? Because when the value cycle stops, when the value wheel stops turning, that's when customers churn, uh, even if you, quote, have healthy churn. And then there's also the greatest opportunities for growth. Where does the value drop off? When you think about your customers, your customer base, and the segments that support them. And then finally, what are the primary value drivers? Mapping this forces you and your team to get very real about where does value align with product activity. And then finally, OK, so let's say um, you're like, Adrian, this is really great. We're not even anywhere close to doing this. That's OK. That's why you're in this talk. Uh, but what, here's what you do. So we're going to map the customer experience, like I mentioned. This is going to take quali qualitative and quantitative insight. And we are going to define success KPIs along the way. And then we're going to measure them. If you don't have Amplitude or Mixpanel or a solution that can help you measure product analytics, I highly, highly, highly recommend it, especially if you are in that growth stage. Um, but chances are you probably already do. You can take advantage of something like this today. All right, so recap. We talked about expansion revenue. You already know what to do if it's kind of low. Next, revenue cohort retention. Uh, and then finally, um, there's the uh, oh shoot, sorry, uh, new user retention and then also customer success-based KPIs. Thank you so much.